guys. He didn't really hit me. And then you see him still, you know, singing. And I don't know what they do. They just chase you. They're not one thing with the thing. They're just so much better. Guys. And then you see my stage. And they're like, oh. They're just like, they're just like a mess for you is what they seem like. Every little movement's for you and no one else. It just seems so personal, but yeah, it's just for everybody. You four guys that uh, I met Paul said, you want to join the band? You know? And then George joined. And then Ringo joined. We were just a band who made it very, very big. I told you. Hello, sir. Hello. Hold on one second. There you go. You guys getting video? No, uh, no. no. Uh, big, yes. big thing great. Yes. Sucks. <laughs> what sucks? Now I get video. Oh, okay. All right. But that great thing sucked. Yeah, dude. That great thing sucks. It's great. So, uh, for the first time ever, I actually listened to the song and the lyrics of When the Lights Went Out in Georgia. Yeah. As one is uh, want to do. Are, are you going to send me video, Andrew? I thought I was. Nah. Hey, there he is. So the lights went down in Georgia, and what did that do to you? You ever hear that song? Uh, Not really. I don't think it did. So it was a big hit in the 70s, and then it got remade yeah. a couple times. It never, never trust a backwoods southern lawyer? Yeah, exactly. So I didn't know. I didn't know anything. I just knew it's a song. I'm like, oh, I remember, like, on the lights around right Georgia's, you know, popular song. But anyhow, I'm listening to it. And it's about, like, finding this murder scene and, and this. And it's told from the point of view of a person in this small town. And it, and it's like the person murdered's named Andy, you know. So, of course, like, ah, oh, you know, Andy's dead on the floor. I'm like, what the hell is this? <laughs> um, so I'm like, what? I, said, I know nothing about the song. I know it's a very popular touchstone song. So I actually look it up. Do you know who sang the first version of it? Uh, I'm going to say... Um, B. Arthur. Ray Charles. You have no idea how close you are, Justin. What? Vicki Lawrence. How? Rue McClanahan? Vicki Lawrence. Wow, really? Yeah, you remember Vicki from Mama's Family? Yeah. Girl, that show? Wow. So, Holy crap. So she actually sang the first version, the one that was the when it first became a big hit. And, and I'm making like, I remember Vicki Lawrence because like, I remember my mom saying, you know, she was on Carol Burnett and because they looked alike and could do comedy bits. And then she took, you know, did the mama character. And and so little did I know. Wow. That's amazing. Uh, <laughs> Screw you, Brian. No, no, no. <laughs> I no I, I, that's not meant in any kind of patronizing way. I promise. No, that wasn't meant in any patronizing way either. Screw you, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> no, like sincerely. Screw oh, really, you. Brian. Seriously, screw off. All right, here we go. Uh, Justin, you sound like way over-modulated. Do I? Yeah, a little bit. when you hit 30. That's right. Hey, happy birthday, Justin Robert Young. Thank you. For your birthday, I killed Hugo Chavez. Just what I always wanted. I was going to send like a tweet of Ghost Dog or something, but... Bad? Uh, Yeah, I think it's good. Better, better, better. Yeah, let me, uh, let me, um, make a sad song and make it better. Yeah. Great. Now we got to pay royalties. Thanks. Justin. Yeah. Way to go, Justin. You just ruined everything. Hello, it's Paul Cartney. I'd like to have my money, please. <laughs> hey, you owe me three pence. All right. There we go. Uh, talk a little bit more, Justin. Check, check, check. Yeah. You can actually goose it up a little bit. Check, 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 yeah, yeah, check. Right, dip, 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 there you go. Hmm. Hmm. So uh, I got a note. From um, the principal's office? No, on Brian, you were actually in the car when it was parked last night. Uh, this morning, a note on my car that said, you are an asshole for parking on my bumper. <laughs> well, I mean, the guy had plenty of room to get out. Yeah. Was he, he's mean, not, what, is he entitled to be? To, he's like, my car is entitled to breathe, man. It needs a good, like, foot. And it's like, it's like, it's, it's 
Liv, it's it's you know killer be killed on those mean parking streets of Oakland, man. Like you you find a spot, you gotta you gotta take it. Like, man, that's it. That is weird. But I thought like it looked like a ticket, and I'm like, oh great, a ticket on my birthday. And then it's just like, no, just a note <laughs> just that you were an asshole. A proclamation I was actually really pumped that you an even are an better asshole. reminder on your birthday. Yeah, <laughs> thirty years of successful assholeness. Yes. All right, I think we are set, and I'm you know, recording. You know, you okay. know what's funny is like I had like a, I live in an apartment complex, and every night I have somebody to park, and we had assigned spaces. Yeah, and so I wrote a letter once. Ha! But I understand. I wrote a very polite letter. I wrote this: "Hey, I understand parking can be difficult here, but there's assigned spaces, and it's it can be a problem if you park in somebody else's assigned space." So. In the future, you know, just there's you know, over. You can look on this side of the street where there's other places to go park, right? Literally, uh, I mean, that was the letter. It was very polite because I figured could be a neighbor, All right? And what did and what happened from there? Um, nobody parked there, and like a year later, I started dating a girl. Oh no! Who lived in my complex. Yeah, and then she mentioned something like, uh, she says, "Oh, you know, I first knew about you." She says, "What?" She says, "Oh, you're no. We were all laughing at you." <laughs> I'm like, what do you mean? <laughs> I said it was a polite letter, you know? That's awesome. And I guess it was because I didn't say, hey, asshole. <laughs> How novel. All right, let me yeah. get a soda and then we'll jump in. All right, I'm going to get this up on the site. Oh, boy. So you see that uh, the uh, Harlem Shake protest in the Islamic world? Yeah, man. It's blowing up. Kind of just when you want to just I mean, make fun of the whole meme, you're like, oh, mortal danger. Are, yeah, these kids are like using it to stand up for you know something real. And if I patronize this, I'm kind of patronizing the idea of freedom. And I'm a horrible person. What <laughs> what just happened? Who's, who's well, patronizing you know, the, who? Yeah, you've seen the Harlem Shake has been blowing up in the Islamic world now. All right, as a, as a way of protesting oppressive governments. Well, I'm down with that, actually. I'm totally yeah, okay. Yeah, I just did. It's like right when we're about ready to be like, oh, Harlem Shake. It was like, now you have to go and make we're gonna We're going to risk bullets to go, oh. It's okay. like uh, it's like uh, that scene from Dumb and Dumber. It's like, just when I thought I couldn't, you know, you couldn't be any more past the Harlem Shake. You go and do yeah. something like this. And, and completely, completely redeem, redeem yourself. yourself. Yeah. <laughs> like, wow. All right. You know. Um, uh, are, are we on? Do we know if the thing is on? I, I just want to say, like, I like oh, how on. how yeah. memes work their around work their way around to other countries, like the losing Super Bowl team shirts. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> <coughs> what is that? What is that? Oh, the, uh, you're saying the memes move the way the losing team Super Bowl shirts do? I get you. <laughs> yeah, that's hilarious. Got another bucket of memes for you. <laughs> All right, man. I think we're ready to rock. No wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. We're not ready to rock. Did I say we're uh, ready to rock? Scratch that. By the way, uh, coming up, we do not have. Uh, let me double check actually for ads in this episode. We a big bad but, buy. What was that? We got like somebody like bought a whole block. Yes, and I have a schedule that starts next week. But uh, oh. they bought like seven ads, which was awesome. Oh, dude, that person's awesome. Of course, that's like twelve bucks, but you know. <laughs> yeah. Which I frankly, uh, are we doing live or are we just doing this for ourselves? Live. I am putting it up on the site. It's just going a little slow right now. I'll wait for that before I begin to broad to say anything important. Um, Iron Man 3 trailer. Why Dope. Is there a new one? Is there a new Hulk one? Buster. Is there a new one? Exactly. Hulk Buster armor. Which it's like. Man, it's going to be awesome in the next Avengers movie. <laughs> You're not going to throw me a uh, don't. Uh, is there a big spoiler in it? 
No, oh, like you just see something that it's it's based off or parts of it are based off uh, a lo- a, a line um, from like the planet the, fr- or no, from no, the no, World War Hulk. Um, and I think that the the Hulkbuster armor is in Extremis, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. All right, are we ready? Uh, uh, we no. Link? I'm waiting on this thing to get ready so I can, or to open so I can put it into. Uh, just so you guys know, if, if there's any way, I, I know we usually do like an hour and a half or whatever, but after being on the road and abandoning Bonnie for four days, it sounds like You're she... looking forward to a three-hour podcast? Done. <laughs> Done. <laughs> Got it. Let's just if keep we, it going. If we can stay a little closer to an hour, I'll be your best friend. <laughs> this is what I'm trying to say. We get the hint. We know you're on TV. <laughs> Save me. An hour. <laughs> we could actually pull Bon Bon in for a question. Yeah, she's putting kids down right now, but I'll uh I'll I'll extend the That invitation. always sounds horrible to me. <laughs> yeah, was, yeah. I know. I was just about to say that. <laughs> That's like that moment in Ghostbusters too, where he's like, "Would you, you know, put her down?" He's like, "You're a terrible burden on your mother, and you're ugly." Yeah. Oh, mini Wolverine there. Yeah. I'm the Keyverine. Wow, dude. Um, I'll tell you what. I learned one very valuable lesson. Since I'm going to do my pick early for picks, my pick is Uber. Uh, it is expensive as balls, but freaking rad that you just used open up your phone and go boo doo dee doo dee and then before you know it, there's a car to take you wherever you want, and you don't have to worry about tip. You don't have to give them money or nothing. You just get in and get out like you're the man. Yeah, like you definitely pay that extra like fifteen dollar premium. Call it the like the boss premium, the boss yeah. fee. But you, you also like don't have to do anything that is ever a problem with cabs. Yeah. Yeah, I uh, you, you hear the uh, criticisms from cab companies and stuff, and and I would say that my experience in cabs is not Horrible. quite what I would define as. <laughs> no, you hate like, everything description about of professional level service yeah, on a e- consistent level. Everything about cabinet is uh, this like from the anxiety of sitting there watching the the fee tick up no matter whether you're moving or not like being stuck in traffic and watching money go upwards and then that awkward like well how much did you like me you want to give me money to the filthy yeah. ridiculous clown cars that they drive around in like cabs are dumb and uber is just rad <laughs> it's just amazing uh all right we should be live on weird things let me Mm, except we're not. Except that we are not. Justin going to make himself a little martini in the middle of the show? Yeah. This is actually perfume that you are all looking at, oddly. That's that's drunk. Uh, sure, let's call oh. it. Let's drink let's some stick perfume. with the martini explanation, Justin. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was more comfortable with that. That was like the weirdest thing about uh, Live and Let Die was like how Bond kind of knows the villains are there because they're using the perfume. <laughs> Uh, you know, I never saw that whole movie. Dude, you know what's really weird? What just hit me, Justin? What? Is I woke up this morning in that room that you're in right now. I know. Travel's yeah. kind of amazing. In a bathtub filled with ice. Yes, in a note. Call 911. Can you put on the link? Tripod. <laughs> All right, now we should be cooking with gasoline. Gasoline. All right, so we are live on Weird Things right now. All right, then let us link. Let us twaddle about. Yeah, weirdthings.com. Oh, you haven't tweeted. I could. Re- I have to type it myself. Guys, yes. so many letters. Weird uh, things. <laughs> All right. Uh, 
right. uh, that's good. Yeah. Now, a little further back, a little further back, maybe, maybe Justin, you could, maybe why don't you sit in the other room? Why don't you do that? No, that's all right. Watch this. Rip. Boom. Now I made you big. I made we you ready? Big. Yeah, I think so. Let me hit record. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna... There we go. Okay. Now I can take notes. <laughs> Live now for weird things. Brian has possum colored hair. Did you say possum? Possum colored yeah. hair. Yeah. No, I'm going to take, I'm going to hopefully get my, I'm going to write an essay and then have it published on Gawker Saturdays. All right, bosses. I am All pressing right. record in three, two, one. We're live. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Main, joined right now straight out of Sim City, Mr. Brian Brushwood. Oh my God, it's kicked out of Sim City. It was like they uh, logged in and everything froze. It's a DRM nightmare up in this BZH. Yeah, That's it's a bit of a say. bit of a kerfuffle. Who's that, that other voice you hear? Slightly more mature, slightly more grown up, because it's his birthday, Mr. Justin Robert Young. Uh, yes, it's me. Hi, did your you get old any pal, Justin Robert Young? Did you get on a gift? This, my name day. Did you get anything for your name day? What loot did you get? Uh, you know, I think I've crossed the Rubicon of like getting things. Like uh, I've I've gotten into the like it's just uh the diminishing returns of what I expect and what I am given for my birthday. Like it's just I'm on the slow march to like it'd be nice to get a call. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, speaking of which, how excited Watch are you? Watch your mailbox. You got not one, but two presents coming, my friend. How oh, excited are no, you? I, I've, I've gotten a bunch of, Ashley got me a bunch of fun stuff, and uh, uh, yeah, no, I got a bunch of awesome things. How excited are you for 60 more years? Like, now, at, at age 30, you can look forward to more and more people for the rest of your life calling you Justin Robert, just a little yet less young. Oh. Yeah, you know, I think that's, uh, it, listen, it's the price you pay for an adjective last name, you know, it's awesome, people remember it, uh, but you know, you're gonna, you live and die, <laughs> you live and die by the adjective. That's true. So uh, let, let's, let's start off with a little bit of birthday make-believe. Okay. Okay, you know, as we get older, we don't have the same expectations like when we're kids, you know, we're kids, we walk through a toy store. And every square foot is filled with the delight and the, and the latest thing we want. As yeah. you get older, you're kind of like, I, you know, as you get older, you're kind of like, ah, maybe I just want some gift certificates. And now, like, those pile up in my wallet. Now I'm kind of like, eh, maybe my Amazon gift card. Like, eh, don't get me anything, you know. I'm close to that point right now. Yeah. But I want you to imagine Justin. <laughs> For my right birthday, just leave you. me alone. Just stop looking at me. Stop is muttering a- that under your breath. That's all I want. All right, go ahead. Imagine there's a box in front of you, Justin. A box, maybe about 15 inches by 15 inches by 15 inches. Okay. This is your birthday box. You open this birthday box. Yes. What is it besides a better camera mount? Uh, No, I'm trying to get it so it's like it's eye line. Keep it no low, and then just turn the thing. (laughs) This is great for the audience. What is in the box? Uh, The box uh, has Ashley's head. That is a horrible thing to say. (laughs) No, it's not Ashley's head. It's uh, it's uh, no, she's just doing her laughs. Uh, No, it's uh, I would say untold wealth. Well, so, so you, like, you, you mean like like the Hope Diamond or something in there? No, no, no. A, 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 a credit card that just never runs out. Oh, well, all right. I mean, that, I mean, in order to support that, you'd have to have an infrastructure that's far larger than the box. Well, I mean, listen, I was just asked about what's in the box. Why don't you just say, right. Gwyneth Paltrow's head. I mean, you could open it and be like, and it's the Spoilers. credit card. Warren Buffett and this sort of really dodgy written letter that you realize he's got <laughs> Alzheimer's and gave you yes. this credit card but forgot about it. He's like, please spend this in remembrance of me. I'm yeah. Warren Buffett. Yeah. Pick me up a few things, whatever. You know, here's to get my pills and the New York Times. No, would the be- actual New York Times. Yes, please buy it. it. You should be able to negotiate it down to like a $700 tag and they'll throw yeah. in the offices. All right. Bri, what's yours? 
Ah, dude, if we're talking like some kind of serious wealth. Uh, uh, can it be an object that's not necessarily invented yet? Can I can I wish? Sure. For st- oh, sure. Dude. I, I like I like the idea that it's contained in the box. So instead of Justin's credit card, we're gonna get him like a pile of cash. All right. All right. Um, uh, well then for me, you know, some kind of science fiction, I would like, I, I, tough call. I don't know if you could fit both a portal gun and a lightsaber in there, but if you mm-hmm. could, I'd want both. We'll say a portal gun, a lightsaber, a uh, functional phaser, stun gun. And, um, what was that thing that the tomorrow people use? The joint, I want to say jaunt, jaunt where they, uh, they, joints. Could, they smoke they joints. Could, they could jaunt without having to have a device. You, you, but if you were a uh, if you weren't a tomorrow person, you had to have like the little helper thing. Right, or they give give me one of those two, and also from uh, uh, the multiple Earths things. The I want to say uh, was it Larry Niven, David Niven. Uh, uh, it was like it was like a, it, it was the, the the conceit of the book was that there were all these Earths that were in in ser- parallel next to each other, and you could jump westward or eastward using a simple box. But the box was just kind of like a MacGuffin. To tell yourself, you know, you know, that you needed the box to believe you could jump from one to the other. One of those two, like marijuana. Yes. So also, oh, also like just some like some some black tar heroin, just so yes. I could sell it and get it, make a little cash. So oh, you just right. want to seem cool amongst your friends. <laughs> I think maybe like the Iron Man suit. Oh, like that one that was in the briefcase from Iron Man 2. Yeah, like an extremist nano armor or something like that. That's all. That's all I'm asking for. Nothing common. Because you could fly and beat up your enemies. Man, I used to to love Iron Man so much that I would read and reread. Marvel Universe used to have this comic book that was nothing but like a mugshot drawing of each character full body. Uh, from side angles and everything, and just a list of all their awesome numbers. Mm. And I remember seeing like oh, the yeah. Iron Man armor specifically uh, multiplied your strength times 90. And I would do the math. I would be like, all right, I could lift like 50 pounds. So I'd be like 500 <laughs> pounds. 4,500 pounds? Wow, I'd be strong. And meanwhile, Brian, are you doing your math homework? No. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to fantasize, Mom. <laughs> Yeah, I love that stuff. I like whenever you would find like the specs on, let's say, the Bat Cave or what. Because I'm looking at that like that was that was my architectural digest as a kid. Like this is what <laughs> I'm going to do when I grow up. Yeah, absolutely. So was, these are the plans. This is this is this is what uh, this is what I'd like to go with. So I think that's that's interesting. I think we revealed quite a bit about ourselves here. Uh, yes, Justin, the the capitalistic money grubbing sociopath well because you know you always just want i mean this is like like the genie question like you just always want the wish that gets you more wishes you know like that's, that's mon- the ultimate money, so what goal. you're saying is money is his wishes is right. in paper let form me refer- money let me, is let me, let me the, the, the ever, rep- ever replicating source there. of money is that so all right let me narrow the question down for it let's bring it into the realm of possibility you get a phone call right now okay yep. literally the all phone right. rings like ah but it's from redmond washington Okay. Who? Hi, it's Bill Gates. Okay. And, uh, oh, I'm a big fan. Big, big, big fan. Bill, really? Wow. I can send uh, you it's, it's an honor. anything in this 15 by 15 by 15 inch box, the scenario that Andrew just described. <laughs> What's it going to be? So I can't get like the 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 credit card that just never really runs out. Like well, I'll just be tapping on like, the no, no own, fantasy like, things. It's just got to be a simple a thing that he could put in there. See, here's the thing: like you want to wish for some kind of precious resource, but then the problem is now you're gambling on like which resource will remain precious. Because like diamonds are valuable right now, but for all we know, the De Beers oligarchy will just all of a sudden or oligopoly will all of a sudden just. Uh, you know, what's because you know they could grow diamonds now. They 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 make that uh, I, I don't know what they used to seed it, but they make that gaseous mixture of like methane and a bunch of uh, uh, carbon. I'm yeah. getting it all wrong. All right, all right. Hey, Brian. What? Shut up. I'm on the phone with Bill Gates. Okay. Well, uh, oh, Bill. What's up? Um, I want the patents to Microsoft Office. <laughs> well, he he that Microsoft owns that. So yeah. It's like it's in a be word? In a bo- something physical okay, inside okay, of the but box. I think my favorite part of what just happened is how like I got quiet 
waiting patiently like what's he say did he give it <laughs> like something about justin actually holding a phone up to his head has me convinced that this is real and now there's the caveat if bill thinks it's stupid he's gonna hang up uh-oh oh all right uh ah man this is I'll like tell you what this is like the price is right without going over rule that changes things yeah because you don't want to do something stupid like i don't know a steak <laughs> You don't want that. You want something cool, something something unique, something amazing that like you could get from nobody else in the world but Bill Gates. Like it could be like a, a special, like very very biologically rare egg of some variety. That'd be kind of sure. cool, like a Yeti egg. Yetis hatch, hatch from eggs, right? The I dragon think, eggs. Dragon I think, eggs. I think Bills are grading the phone call right now. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> I well, forgot. What? Okay. I think it's fair to say that if Bill Gates is a fan of either this podcast or any other podcast I'm on, this is easily like we're we're batting in the middle of how dumb I can get. Oh yeah, I I let's assume for the moment that Bill does not believe that Yeti eggs are real. All right. That's let's let's use that as a baseline. That he might think a Yeti egg maybe He's like, is that something I can get in like the Hamlinger Schlimmler catalog or whatever? <laughs> the Hamlinger Schlimmler. Uh, man, I, okay, look, I'm just gonna go for it. I'll say, I'll say, I want an equal mix of diamonds, gold nuggets, platinum, and uh, ooh, uh, how how valuable are rare earth magnets yet? Not are in there going to be a shortage of that suit and antimatter. There you go. I want some antimatter. Antimatter. In, there too. All right. in fact, the whole thing antimatter. I'll figure out a use for it. Yeah, isn't it like 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 nickel mines? Like that's what like, like there's like Russian like the guy who owns like the Brooklyn Nets is like you know a, a nickel mine owner, and apparently the the way you own a nickel mine in Russia is by walking into a nickel mine with a gun and saying I own the nickel mine. Really? All right. Apparently, it's it's a bit of a wild west out there in Russia. Hmm. So right. so uh, so what would you get in there, Andrew? Uh you know, I think I think uh you think like what has the most value? You know, Brian mentioned like precious jewels and rubies and things like that. Um I wonder though, like uh what what are like the most what are the most valuable objects by weight? And I wonder if it might even be like processors. Oh, sure. Oh. You know, I wonder if you had, you know, you know, whatever the, the highest end processors are. Because, you know, the processor is actually just a little thin wafer inside that little plastic case. And I wonder if you just said, well, Bill, you know, you know a thing or two about electronics. You know, uh, what it reminds me of is um, uh, when I was and this is the, a few engineers out there will remember this time. And you might remember it, Andrew. But like in the early 90s, there was I remember. The, and this is pre-internet, like maybe the Internet was there, but nobody was using it. Maybe yeah, get someone BBS web. or whatever. Um, yeah, certainly no World Wide Web. And I remember going and buying, uh, you know, I think it was RAM at some shop. And they said, um, hey, you might want to buy as much RAM as you can because there was a fire at a plant and RAM's about to go up in price. I'm like, first of all, that's dumb. Everyone knows computers. Everything gets cheaper uh, over time. Yeah. What I didn't understand at the time and what took years for me to grasp was that a fire meant that uh, like there are three major RAM manufacturers in the whole world. And like one of them exploded, basically. And yeah. then the next year... Like the RAM doubled, tripled, quadrupled in price, and it was, it was so weird. Like, like that, that almost would never happen now. Like that moment of remember a that guy uh, at, hard drives. No, no. no, no well, I mean, like, like yeah. that moment of a guy saying, "Hey, this is very cheap right now, but when the wave of information hits, this is going to be crazy expensive. So you might want to buy ah, more." I get you, like I get nowadays, you, yeah. that that wave, that shock wave of information happens instantaneously. Like instantaneous. Worldwide. Yeah. 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 Like, like by the time you hear about it, it's already more expensive. Yeah, you know, it's curious. Is that's when you have to look for like those signals that are further away from what could be happening, and uh, you know, is is you have to think about know, like secondary and tertiary effects of things happening. Yeah, and like you know, like is is you know, oh, you know, did such and such RAM company are they taking you know more orders than they'll be able to have? Are they going to have bankruptcy payment issues or something? Are they? Yeah, I mean, it's weird. The entire you know fund managers and all they do is try to study that and predict what will happen from those things, which, you know, you know, the, the origins of that was agriculture and, you know, we can have a good season or not. If we think it's going to be a bad season, then we're going to buy up as much grain as we can and overcharge those Hittites. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have a commercial? 
No. You know what? Can I give one away? I'd like to give yeah. away a plug Go. to someone. A uh, friend of the show, if you ever watch a little thing called a Totally Rad Show, then you know that Jeff Kanata, along with Dan Trachtenberg and uh, Alex Albrecht, um, hosted a show all about sci-fi geek things, uh, whether it's board games, comic books, movies, books, uh, television. And uh, I, I suspect that any one of those three gentlemen would be completely awesome to have on this show sometime. Uh, but specifically, you know, Dan Trachtenberg is out there uh, directing Why the Last Man now, and uh, Alex Albrecht has other big projects he's doing. Uh, Jeff Kanata is, wants very much to carry the torch for the Totally Rad Show, and he just launched a new Kickstarter uh, for his next project. And of course it'll be, it won't be the totally rad show, but it will, it will fill that niche in a new way. He's got ideas that I really like. Um, he launched it, I believe two hours ago. And as I look at it right now, it looks to be almost 80% funded in just two hours. That's how much goodwill. And, and, uh, and to be honest, this guy, I think he under asked for it under his goal. Do, do me a favor, head on over to kickstarter.com. Just type in Jeff Kanata and uh, throw him some bucks because How do you uh, spell Kanata, Bray? Two N's, one T. C A N N A T A. There we go. No, he was on NSFW uh, this week. He's an awesome guy. Uh, he is, his project's going to be great. You know, he, he described it to me for anybody who, uh, who gets, you know, this reference that he wants to do kind of a, a pardon the interruption style show for geeks, which I think is something that, you know, has long since, uh, been an idea that, that could have its due. So, well, and we uh, even, we even tossed around that idea with game on for a little bit, but it never quite, you know, or that style of thing. We wanted to model a lot of game on, on sports, uh, sports center shows, but, uh, but that never quite happened. So it'd be great to see that happen with Jeff's project. Absolutely. Check it out. Very, very cool. Um, I have a question for you, Brian. Yeah. And, and there's a connection here. A while ago, a friend of yours, a rather eccentric friend, which says a lot, <laughs> given your friends. So, yeah, it sound, actually sounds a little bit redundant when you say my, my eccentric friend. So, one of my had friends, yes. Had an opportunity, very incredible opportunity, but for reasons uh, he could better explain, gave up that opportunity to take it up later on, and that opportunity fell upon somebody else, and they became the world first private citizen to become an astronaut. I knew. Oh, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> You're so talking that, about... that was Richard Garriott was going to be the first guy up going space privately. And then he sold his ticket to Dennis Tito, and Dennis Tito got to be the first guy up there. And this is a little funny side note. So, you know, NASA will not let you call your... NASA says will not acknowledge that anybody who goes up is an astronaut, right? right. You're, like, yeah. you're like, oh, no, you're, you're not. You're, you have some... But strangely, they will call an astronaut to someone who's never left the planet. Yes. And it's going to be very interesting because SpaceX is supposed to be testing eventually their rocket with their own SpaceX crew and sending yeah. them up into space. And are, are we going to still hold that? No. Sorry. You guys are not astronauts mentality, which is silly, but that's not the point I was going to bring up. Um, it'll just be curious to see where NASA, you know, and that, there was, there was NASA. And I would say in the last few years is different than what NASA was before. When Tito went up and out, there was sort of, there was this weird kind of hostility towards private space exploration. It oh, was, sure. it was, it was this, Oh, we, you know, this guy's buying his way up there. That's wrong. Meanwhile, we'll put a Senator up there. Yeah, you know, yeah, to test, you know, how space is going to affect old people. Yeah, well, exactly. Like, like, uh, well, it's important we send you up so that we could just like look at how old you are, yeah. John Glenn. Yeah. We need you up there. We're really curious. There's all this medicine to be discovered in zero G, but we want to know, like, seriously, how old are you? And we'd like yeah. to see how you look all floating with your old you wrinkly know, skin. And, and then he was, goes, he goes and, and gets a different up administration. There and a lot of things have changed. NASA is 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 is, uh, you know, you can't. You know they've they've got a much more. Yeah, I think the attitude is in a, in a much positive place now. Now Dennis Tito came out press conference said, "Hey, you know, it'd be really cool. Let's send some people in a spaceship to go to a flyby of Mars. Not land on Mars, yeah, but not do an orbit because that would take extra fuel. But to do a flyby, so basically." There are these opportunities when the Earth's orbit and Mars' orbit comes in alignment. You can send something away from Earth, pretty high velocity. It hits the Mars gravity well, loops around Mars, 
and comes back to Earth in a sling gravity slingshot. So, like, okay. uh, I guess, I guess, if we're, if we want to picture it in the fastest, easiest configuration, it would be like, um, let's say uh, you got the orbit of Earth when you're the farthest west of the sun. We'll say that's A. The farthest east is B. You jump off. Uh, is, this is what I'm picturing. Tell me if I'm right. And let's say, let's say, let's I'm say. I'm so confused already, but please continue. Well, oh, 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 picture a clock then. Fine. Uh, sun's in the middle, right? And so the 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 Earth is at uh, nine o'clock. We'll say that Mars is in a farther out ob- orbit at mid at twelve. And so you jump off at nine o'clock. You swing towards Mars. You whip around and whip whip past it, and then you land on Earth at at the three o'clock spot. Did any of that make sense? I'm sure it did. No, all right. Uh, I'm not, I'm not hitting the what, same I know rhythm. that we're going to rock around the clock tonight. <laughs> yes. On Mars. <laughs> yes, Haley and his comments. Uh, so how long of a trip is this? Like, what are we so, talking about time-wise? So it's, the trip is based upon the idea that there's the, you, you get these optimum points in which you know, Mars is coming close to or you know, within a period of time when it's the optimum point. And we have, like think, one in the two years, then once in 2018. The next one's not going to be for like till 2030. Okay? Yeah. So... Right. The trip, if they launch in in 2018, 2018 again, it's five years away, would take 501 days. That does not sound untenable. I mean, this is how long? How long did it take to get to the New World? Or if you're Magellan, Magellan was gone for what? Two years? Two and a half years? I'm gonna look this up. Here, you keep talking. I'm gonna find out how long Magellan was out. Yeah, but Magellan was still comfortably within the Earth's atmosphere, not bombarded by cosmic rays. Yeah. Um, yeah, but he had sharks. That he could eat. Yeah. Um, okay. There's that too. Mermaids. See, the crackings. longest. The the longest duration is still like 464 days. Wait a or minute. Something. Hold on. Put yeah. There he goes. 1519 to 1522. Three years. That's twice. So so this is twice as long as this trip. But it wasn't three years all at sea. No, that's true. That's true. What? But also he didn't have penicillin and science. Yes. So and that's the a, number of people who returned on that voyage was what percentage of the people that left? I don't know, not much. But I'm t- yeah. <laughs> what I'm saying is is that you know we're all we're you know we got a long history of explorers and Wait, I I don't think it's a matter of necessarily the willpower as much as the technology. So yeah, can can problems, we do this physically? So the tentative plan is if the Falcon Heavy, which SpaceX is is working on and hopes to be able to test sometime this year. To use one Falcon Heavy to send your air, send your your spaceship off, accelerate you know launch this thing out of Earth's atmosphere, out of Earth orbit towards Mars, do the slingshot, come back at a ridiculously high rate of speed, and that's one of the things is you have what's called uh, you know Mars entry, m- lunar entry velocities, which is how fast you have to come back to sort of you know escape you know their orbits, whatever. Anyhow, we have the shielding now, Pika X, which is a very very high. Uh, High intensity shielding that can handle this, and that's what the uh, the Dragon Craft has, and that's what it was developed. Pika was developed by NASA, then the Pika X is this newer, cheaper version that's better. Whatever. Anyhow, it's one of these tech we can lay out on paper and say, okay, we have all these little pieces of technology here. The bigger challenge comes into uh, assuming we have a Falcon Heavy. If we don't, we could use a couple other conventional rockets to assemble this thing. Five hundred days in space is a long time. And it it's is. a long time because you're going to be in something that's going to have maybe five or 600 cubic feet. I don't know. Maybe it'll be a little bit larger, but you're going to be a very, very small area. Everything you eat and drink has to be contained inside of there. We've never gone 500 days without a resupply of the space station. You've got the other problem is the radiation. Intense, intense, intense cosmic rays. Okay. And... Okay, now what do you say? Like, uh, like some people are like, ah, you just put shielding on there. Like, what? Why can't you just have? Well, and shielding? also, how do you respond to the scientific paper that was put out where uh, Reed Richards and Sue Storm and their brother and yeah. his friend went up there and came back with superpowers? Yeah, come on, you're telling me the cosmic rays are all bad? Then explain. Not all bad. Uh, it probably helps some of the mutations that brought life about on Earth. But here's the thing. So there is a plan for handling this and to, to minimize the effect of cosmic rays, but they're looking for a man and wife, ideally, past the childbearing age because the chances of having healthy children after this are going to be greatly diminished and also maybe to reduce the idea of you know a pregnancy midway. Um, 
but anyhow, that's the, the radiation will be intense, but it, it's survival. We've had you know astronauts 464 days up there. They're going to try to shield. Shielding radiation shielding is an evolving technology, and it's getting progressively better. And we have things like that. Eventually, we're going to go from sort of reactive shielding to where we'll probably be able to do that you know mission safely. But radiation right. is a serious. Now, now, when you when you talk about uh, reactive uh, uh, shielding, like like. What one of the things that uh, that protects us here on Earth is the magnetic field, right? We have this incredible big magnetic shield. Like, could 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 we not? Are, are there any plans that you know of to replicate a similar effect? To essentially, make a force field shield, basically. We well, have you have you have you have a magnetosphere, and you also have a very thick atmosphere. Okay. Okay. There are plans to do things like one thing. One idea is to try to use magnetic fields. Another thing is to actually use basically like a. a you know, layers of, of like a metal sort of mesh or netting. When a, a particle hits it, it basically creates a counter particle, whatever annihilates it, or basically reroutes and recharges. And so, reactive shielding is the idea. Of every time it gets hit, it basically tries to redirect or whatever. Mm-hmm. Math, I don't understand, but there are plans in. But that that won't be ready by then. They have a plan though. They do have a plan though, because the biggest problem is other than you know how do you can fit enough food and water inside of it, but they have a plan to help prevent the the to diminish some of the effects of cosmic rays but i want to ask you right now i mean does this sound like an interesting you know 500 days yeah would you go brian dude well how many how many folks are we talking is it the three of us two. or two. just two people can can i pick the other person yeah i mean they're they're looking for husband and wife so if you and bonnie want to go all right no oh, i'd it'd be a good getaway so five years that means what 500 penny days. is 500 14? days 500 days 500 so, days no no, no but, but it's five years from now Oh, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. This happened. Yeah. It's 2018. Yeah. Penny is uh, four, turning 14. Holy crap. Uh-huh. And uh, uh, I guess Callie's now a five year old running around. We're like, all right, we'll see you in a couple of years. Mommy and daddy have to go to Mars just to look at it. Now, here's the bad part like, you get all that way, and all you do is get yourself a close gander. That's all you get out of it. Yeah. That's kind of. I mean, but you are, you are, you know, the on. How many times in life do you get the opportunity to literally be the trailblazers that have gone the furthest of any adventurer ever? Okay. You will have the most impressive adventure in the history of humanity. I guess. Uh, and cancer. Well, yes. I mean, possibly you're gonna, cancer. You're, yeah. Listen, higher we're risk of the cancer. dice on sure. cancer here, sure. folks. Uh, you want to know what? I'm actually, I'm privy to these secret plans. Uh, I know what our shielding solution is going to be. Uh oh, is it what I think it is? Because I I think I read an article about this. Brian, yeah, we want you and Bonnie. What first? Are are you in? Are you signing oh, sure. up? Sure, of course. No, done. Yeah, we'll take a trip. We'll be pioneers. The good news is we have the technology already. In fact, it resides in your home. Whoa, fantastic! You mean to shield everything? I'll be okay. Absolutely. And it will be completely uh, self-contained. Uh, the, the, the shielding will have uh, a, a, a complete correlation to the weight of your food. Oh, fantastic. Wait, what, so we're not, what a weird wait, thing We're not you going to, to have to carry anything else extra. Yep. Uh, wait, so you're, you're saying like we'll leave and we don't yeah. – well, because I'm in, I'm in the ship right now, and I'm looking around. I see a yeah. ton of food. I see a ton of food everywhere. This, yep. They got to like this place is wallpapered with with like ready to eat food packets, but I don't yeah. see any shielding. Well, Brian, the shielding lies in you. Uh, what you you inject something in me? Oh, I get it's like a vaccine against cosmic rays. Easy. No, got it. What? It relied. It, it, it resided in you before you even took this mission. What, uh, in fact, you've been creating this shielding for as long as you've lived. Uh, is, is it? Is, is the shielding boogers? Andrew, what is the shielding? <laughs> Butt boogers. <laughs> <laughs> so the part of the plan of providing shielding. Hold is, on, hold on. I can't let that go. I have never heard the phrase butt boogers before in my life, but it is instantly my all-time favorite phrase. <laughs> I was, was going to say, Andrew uh, has officially uh, invented Penny's favorite word. <laughs> I term. can't wait to use that on Penny. All right, go ahead. So the idea is to use, you're inside the sealed thing, and when you use the bathroom in space, it's not like 
they open up a chamber that opens up to the outside and everything gets, you know, ejected. shot out. Sure. Like, like the whole of like, you know, some bus that a rock and roll band uses to travel across America. No, no. Right. What happens there is that this is all contained inside of there and it's a contained system. And so the idea is you're going to use the bathroom and it's going to go inside of they call these stealable pouches that are then going to be affixed to the walls. So you're saying like uh, you'll literally be uh, dropping bricks that will make up your protective fort. Yeah. So that's your. I mean, they'll be that's inside. I, with okay, you. okay, okay. Look, let's be mature about this. It's like yes, you're gonna get the feet. Let's gonna get- talk about the real mature scientific <laughs> element of butt boogers. <laughs> <laughs> ah, gentlemen. I'm afraid it's time we addressed what has been on all our minds. Uh, okay, so like the food. Uh, so if I understand this right, the thinking is um, like uh, the water is a big part, right? What you want is mass to stop all of that radiation from coming on in, and water does a good job because because it's relatively dense. Uh, so you got all this food that has a bunch of water in it, and you set them all up as bricks all over the place. Um, and but they're in, they're going to be in like these little silver mylar pouches. You grab one down. You tear it open, you Pass eat what's it around. in it. <laughs> then, 99 bags of poop on the wall. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but I'm saying, I'm saying you don't have to look at what's in it. You know, you'll just, it'll be, it'll be there. black bags up there. All the time. That's, surrounding you. Okay, but that's already, like my parents have a septic tank. And so they're out there lurking underneath the ground is their butt boogers. in a zero G environment. Every time you touch the wall or hit the wall, but, uh, you're in a small, tiny, tiny little box. I ain't, well, I ain't you're in a tiny little it. box, insulated plus, by your own feces. Plus, if I if I I got to assume they're like uh, removing about they're de- it's dehydrated, you know, like because uh, like I in India think- they they make they they made I, I assume nowadays they're a lot more modernized. But I remember learning as a kid that people in India would would use manure. Uh, to dehydrate and build their houses out of. So, what's wrong? I, I Why do you know hate if India? They're going to be doing that because um, that's you know a, a heat intensive process, and there's also it gives off chemicals odors. Can we can we talk about the smell issue? Like, I mean, like in space, can you smell your own butt boogers? Like, I mean, if you're surrounded <laughs> by butt boogers, this is going to be like an ever continuing stink. That's thing? the thing. It's like you With, know one micrometeorite. No, but, but this is already this is already a, a problem. I mean, aren't there infections on the International Space Station? Don't they say like uh, like it's physically you know like like you have to brace yourself for the smell inside the ISS? And then yeah. there, there and are they, people and that's, who that's got and they're able to every every four or five months send up new supplies and recycle stuff and filters and things like this. This yeah. is a system. This is a this is a self contained can that you're going to be locked inside of. Right. Well, and, and, and plus, like, people get ill because there's all this fecal material just floating around in space. It doesn't land on the ground. No, yeah, all right. I just, but if, 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 if we're to look at it seriously, like, obviously, things like this, you know, technology has, has a habit of not evolving at a slow, even pace. You know, it, it jumps and leaps forward as, you know, the right opportunities and uh you know other elements kind of come together if we are in a more face or space forward kind of world where we're launching up private citizens a lot more often is it crazy to think that we are going to be trying to solve the same radiation shielding problems or that that are evolving or our thought on that won't have evolved significantly in five years we're going to have, I guess part of it is that there's, there's always going to be a better technology. Right. And the yeah. question is, is when do is you it say, better than butt boogers? <laughs> you know, when, yeah, when do we say fine, but let's go do this now. Or when do we say, let's wait five years or 10 years. And there's, that's that question of, you know, there will always be safer ways to do things. Always do that. Do you always, but then if you say, we've always got to wait for the safest way, then you never do anything. And you right. have to say, what, when do you say, you know, now's the time to do this. And when I read about this, I said, yeah, it's kind of cool, 500 days. But then I read, man, they got to 
this doesn't sound healthy. <laughs> yeah, this does but they're, not they're sound- in bags, man. It's like uh, for somebody as I'm really surprised, Andrew, that for somebody as Mars crazy as you, you would let butt boogers stand between you yeah, and the God of War. I, I want to get their dignity. I don't want to be doing the first broadcast and freaking like the kid from Slumdog Millionaire. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I think the problem is, is that like, you know, if this is your solution, and we obviously know that there are a lot of problems that go along with us, with humans living in very, very close proximity to human waste, that like if, if something goes wrong or somebody gets sick in the middle of this journey, you're kind of screwed. All right. Right. I, well, I've got I've got a question for you, too. Which yeah. which is more dignity? Uh, <laughs> arriving or, or doing a flyby of Mars in the USS butt boogers or uh, freaking the Apollo missions where people crapped in their own pants and just sat there in their own filth and that that when they splashed down after three days of just wallowing like a baby with diaper rash, they, they, they landed and to where the Navy SEAL teams opening up the capsule, one of them vomits from the smell of it. Like, which which one of those is more dignified? But Brian, you're going to get that from this with 500 days. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would go with the, the three-day version. Yeah, but at least, I'll take three days at least you get to wipe to in, the, in the 500-day version. You will not yeah, get in diaper rash until they in until they realize that they under that some egghead under uh, estimated the wipe quotient. Nah, I don't know. And you run out on day two hundred and fifty. Yeah, I I don't know. I would I man three whole days of just rolling around in it. It's gonna be over in three days. Five hundred. I'm saying five hundred. 500 days, it's like, look, I mean, it's like, it's it's in, it's no different than a, uh, I, I don't know. I'll, I'll kick this to the listeners. It's, it's I enough, would much it's rather. It's enough for that delightful Joseph Gordon-Levitt fellow to date Zoe Deschanel. <laughs> <laughs> I would rather, I would rather. Let's do a sequel of 500 Days to Mars. Go. Joseph Gordon-Levitt and Zoe Deschanel, they go to Mars and they're pooping in bags. This is <laughs> my, my, my assumption is that the bag system is not going to be perfect and that all the problems you described with the Apollo missions are going to happen to this in the first few weeks and then it gets worse from there. Hmm. I I mean, what, what other option would – I mean, for what other option do you think people would do? Okay, let's say, let's say magically – they are able to uh, solve the space radiation problem, right? Cosmic rays yeah. are no longer an issue. Where do you think the waste's going to go, Andrew? I, I would, I would like the same place we put it on the space station and the international and the space shuttle. Okay, and a separate system isolated from people. Well, there's a reason why we build toilets as far away from houses, or we pump the stuff away. You know, the, but, the, but the first ancient humans to figure this out and enjoy the health benefits. We're on to something. Well, but it's it, the, each one will be totally sealed and encapsulated in, in, in a, a little in a butt break. bag on the wall waiting for you to, hey, let's play some ball. Hit it, smack. Well, uh, how is that any different from uh, micrometeorite busts through the space septic system? But that's in a separate contained system. Well, not, not, once, just- not once it blasts through, pokes a hole through it. You're, the amount of surface area that's now exposed by putting over the entirety of your thing, and if, if your septic system gets punctured, and that's on an external part of your system. Right, but in fact, actually, I would say that you're safer with the butt bag system because each individual butt bag only has like a pound of material in it. You bust the the, the space septic system, then you hit the jackpot of butt boogers all over the place. You can't even breathe. You die. You die it's suffocating a separate system. on your own boogers. That, that, that was designed to prefer that situation. Though. Oh, you can't just wave your hands and imagine. No, but it is. Wave. I mean, that that's that's a thing. I mean, there there well, you can design that sept the space. Septic I system I think I think you guys are just being immature. I think this is the best discussion we've ever had <laughs> on the Weird Things podcast. <laughs> Where is poop safest? <laughs> Nay, most effective. I could see like uh, propaganda films that Andrew narrates, like the Brown Menace. <laughs> You're keeping you from the red planets. <laughs> I just, I, uh, you know, I, I'm all for Mars, but not at the, the cost expense. Is too high. 
You wouldn't eat. Listen, ma- but man, that, I'll tell you what. I wasn't this, dude. I'll say this very, much: the the very nature of adventure that that there's somebody who says butt bags in, yeah. totally in. Are you kidding? I'm me? in on it. And to that's go to what Mars qualifies that half crazy person to be the person who is the greatest adventurer in human history. Well, can I tell you what I heard about this? I thought one person came to mind. Who's that? David Blaine. Oh yeah, dude. He'd be all like, "Already did it." <laughs> Blaine, <laughs> no, Blaine right now is like, he's like, a, oh, "I was actually working on." He'd be that like, "He'd open a Ziploc bag, one bag, I can do it." No, 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 we'll give you as many. No, I think I can manage. <laughs> dude, I would eat a butt bag of of boogers uh, in order to go to Mars. Right now, if you if you have if the, if a genie came out, hey, Bill Gates just sent you a box. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, Brian, let's say theoretically there was a person in your house right now that's doing nothing but creating butt boogers. <laughs> uh, dude, I totally, I, if it, if it was like the cost where like, it's a hundred percent safe, you'll definitely come back. it will be a crazy trip. Uh, yeah, man. How much, wait, 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 like, do you realize that right now we are like a friendship with Elon Musk away from becoming like the like most awesome shock jock radio bit ever? <laughs> like if Brian eats a eats a butt booger, oh like God. he gets to go to Mars. This would be amazing. Come back next week when we do a live remote from Stucky's bar. <laughs> I say it's time for picks. Uh, you know what? I'll give my pick, and uh, the, I'm giving this pick only based on the 10 minutes I've been able to play it. <laughs> but yes. uh, uh, I finally, I, I just got home. For those of you who don't know, I uh, spent a delightful weekend with just Robert Young, and we went and saw uh, uh, Brett Rounceville get married to Katie Robinson. and uh, uh, Willingly, too. On purpose, in yeah. front of the whole world. Uh, I got home hours ago. First thing I did was uh, was download and install SimCity, uh, partly because I've been excited about the game for a long time, and I played the original back on my 286 20 years ago, but also because uh, PC Gamer is doing their, uh, I'm going to use air quotes here for those of you guys who are audio listeners, celebrity SimCity thing. It's uh, where it's uh, it's me, it's a uh, 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 kicker from No, there's like Minnesota. actual celebrities on there. Yeah, yeah, one of the Minnesota Vikings, like their, their kicker is oh, on yeah, there. Yeah, the punter, Chris Clue, <clears throat> who's a big Warcraft guy. Yeah, uh, um, uh, Veronica Belmont, who is, uh, of course, now the host of the Gizmodo program on uh, BBC America. Uh, uh, the Gizwiz, she calls herself. She <laughs> loves burritos. Did you see that? <laughs> Uh, Gary Witta, of uh, former editor in chief of PC Gamer, who's the person who wrote book Eli and this summer's upcoming blockbuster uh, After Earth, uh, <clears throat> directed by M Night Shyamalan. Uh, and uh, anyway, I'm really excited. Oh, and Notch, creator of Minecraft, right? So it's like I'm all in the game where it's like I want to have a creative, crazy kind of world. And I've only made it halfway through the tutorial, and I already love it. It's already everything I liked about the original Sim City. Uh, obviously way more beautiful, way more fidelity and detail and, uh, uh, very, very simple, very intuitive so far. Uh, the only problem of course is everyone right now, as I look over at uh, glancing at the tweet deck, you can see the how people howling about the DRM, the fact that you have to connect to servers in order to play even for the single player game. Part of that is, is for, uh, you know, protecting against copyright, which is bogus. But the other part of it is that there's like uh, you could trade from one city to another and they have kind of global market prices that have to be configured from servers. But uh, but I love the idea. I love what they're doing. And it's good to see SimCity back. I never got into The Sims, but I'm glad to be playing SimCity. Uh, let me ask you just one DRM question. Uh, you know, you had a game like like Spore that really kind of buckled under like the DRM controversy. Do you think it's that as bad this as is that big experience. enough to do no, that? No, it's it's well. This is the thing: is you have to get uh, EA's Origin, which uh, so like literally like the most miserable downloaded game experience I've ever had in my entire life was Spore. It it corrupted everything so bad with this DRM that it torched my whole computer. I lost a bunch of information. I had to scrap everything and reinstall from scratch. Uh, and as I, every time I look at Spore, all I think of is the disappointment of the game and how miserable the installation was. Uh, and now in my little EA origin thing, cause I hate, I hate it right now, but is, uh, is SimCity next to Spore. And so far the launch of SimCity has been absolutely abhorrent. It's been awful. 
Why does Will but, Wright hate you so much? I don't know. I don't know. It's I'm having bad luck, sir. The guy that talks about fun. Yeah. You know what's uh, fun? But, but, Restarting. But, 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 Wait, what is? <laughs> restarting over and over. In fact, yeah. we'd like to get you five minutes into the game and give you the chance to remember how fun restarting is. Uh, but but you would say so far it looks like the strength of the game that once you kind of brave this. Finger, fingers crossed. I'll, I, I mean, what little I've played, I enjoyed so much that I'm going to keep on. I'm going to give them a, the benefit of the doubt and say, huh, EA, biggest video game company in the world. Maybe you would have thought they would have, you know, known how to prepare for this kind of thing. Oh, well. But you've had, I'll tell you, I mean, you've had good experiences. I mean, you had, you had like Mass Effect was, that's an EA title, right? It, it, like, it is, and, but I, I bought that on Steam and, and uh, uh, outside of uh, brief authentication, I don't think I had to do a thing. Uh, Knights of the Old Republic was an EA Steam release. Uh, and of course, but of course that was largely run by Bioware. Um, but like, uh, there's something about Will, Will Wright's titles and me that just, uh, equals exploding on the launch pad but uh but but again yeah. unlike spore like once i got spore working i was disappointed at how simplistic it was i'm hopeful that uh that sim city looks like it's got a lot more depth to it and i'll find out when i jump in andrew what's your pick my pick is just finished watching it last night now i'm watching the director and uh commentary Okay. It's one of those movies that was just just sort of a, a you know, I thought about this, man, I haven't seen this movie in forever. And I remember it being a lot of fun. I want to go back and I want to watch this again and see if I enjoyed it as much going through it again. And I certainly did. Real genius. Um, I think I know. No, Brian, you are wrong. Uh, Justin, perhaps you are correct. And that is Gremlins. Hell oh, yeah. Really? Was it that good? Do not like Gremlins? Well, I just, I never understood. Sure, uh, I, I mean, outside of the the dubious honor of being the 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 title that created the PG-13 distinction, um, I, I only watched it the once when I was a kid. I haven't watched it since I'm an adult. So maybe I don't remember what's so great about it. Gremlins, Brian. Gremlins. <laughs> That's what's it, great about it. There are gremlins in it. What? Did you miss the part with the gremlins? So Gremlins came out in 1984. I think it was like the same week that Ghostbusters came out, actually. And, and the idea wow. of the horror comedy was a very, very uh, – a kind of a recent concept. It was directed by Joe Dante, who did The Howling, which was a kind of a, a different kind of – you know, a mixed, mixed horror and humor at the same point, which was the idea of saying, hey, you can – we can scare people and make them laugh. The screenplay – when I didn't know this until I just you know, read up on this. Do you know who wrote the screenplay for Gremlins? No. Oh, no. The, guy, the writer sent it out as a – he said it was a writing sample because he figured it would be kind of hard to produce. And it was a little bit more frightening than the, the, what, the, what ended up being made. But it was Chris Columbus who oh, went wow. on to write you know, some uh, very, very beloved films and is also the director of Harry Potter and one of the, the EPs of that entire series. And, is, and, the, and the, know, these are of, all uh, Spielberg disciples, Chris Columbus and, and Joe Dante. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They they came from that. Was Spielberg was the one who bought the script and then had Joe Dante produce it, and they wanted to make it kind of an homage in some ways to sort of those old classic kind of films. And they shoot it, you know, the the city is a universal backlot, and they didn't work too hard to disguise it because they wanted to make it feel like those kind of small town movies. And then introduced the idea of these gremlins. It it's I had I mean it was fun. I had fun watching the movie. It was very it was neat to watch it. Realize this is before. You know, we had, uh, you know, the computerized effects, anything like that. You know, realize it's, you know, it's eight years before you're going to get a Jurassic Park and the, the realization that we could just do computers. It's, it's puppets, a lot of puppetries and, you know, large scale models made to look smaller, et cetera. And so technically you kind of get sort of limiting, but it was just a fun, fun movie. I certainly enjoyed watching it. And it just, you know, I certainly uh, identified with the Gremlins more than I care to admit. <laughs> and Steve <laughs> Cates. Well, and not only... But one of the most amazing WTF moments in movie history with the with Phoebe Cates's story about uh, oh, yes. her father. Yes. Oh, wait, like, uh, the Santa Claus. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Oh, my it's God. Just like, I mean, like it, it's a movie that delights in its awesome kind of tonal shifts that you don't like either realize are coming. But then like you're like, wow, this is a different movie than I thought it was. Yeah. And just when you think that you're done with these tonal shifts, there's like in this, like, you know, heartwarming kind of coming of age sort of story. You have 
one of the most morbid, <laughs> weird stories that like has ever been put in any kind of movie with a family of uh, you know sort of. Well, and uh, keep in mind, like, it. yeah, I mean, I when you, I'm glad you mentioned that because it sort of puts into context why they created the PG-13. They're like, okay, look, we get it. It's not R. There's no nudity. There's no cursing. There's none of that stuff. But come on, man, you tell me, you tell <laughs> me to bring a second grader to this thing. Are you serious? A cool second grader. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and all, well, I, I was, have, that I and have Temple a of huge... Doom were the ones that uh, was the motivation. And Spielberg had said, yeah, we need to have this other rating because to go from PG to R doesn't it was a big jump. Well, it. especially it was like G, like PG was just, you know, G with a little sauce on top. Like or, or pretty much anything that wasn't animated uh, would, would be PG. Like uh, because like you'd see someone, you know, either either. If, if you saw anyone punch someone in a gut in a kid-friendly film, then, like, you were out for G because you had violence, kid-on-kid kid Oh, no, not necessarily. It depends when. Remember Star Wars, they added the shot of the arm getting cut off in the, the Mos Eisley Cantina. Yeah. When Obi-Wan pulls out his lightsaber and Lucas went back, they shot that, that shot additionally so they could avoid a G rating because he did not want to have Star Wars be G. Really? Yeah, I mean, G was considered, and that was... You know, every it, it's weird how ratings go. You have like, and you go look at like, look at you know, like what they call pre-code films, yeah, which is before that, like King Kong, original King Kong, pulls a woman out of the, you know, out of her apartment, throws her onto the ground, yeah, okay, you know, bites people in half, chomps yeah. through people, you know, starts removing Feyre's clothes with his hands, and from long shots, she looks like she's naked, okay. Long comes the ratings code, you know, the code, and then you don't get films like that for a long time, yeah. Sure. Um, yeah. And so they kind of, these things kind of come and they go. But, you know, some of what was considered PG would, would be PG-13 today. And some of the things like, you know, like Star Wars was there, was there would have been G if Lucas said, no, 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 we want to get PG. You know, it's an interesting movie if, if you're into this kind of uh, morphing of things. And I, it's an unfair movie and it's clearly a hit piece, but it's interesting to watch. Just It's like having an angry roommate expound on his uh, conspiracy theories. Uh, but this film is not yet rated. I believe should be available for instant streaming on Netflix. Uh, it's uh, it's a bit of a hit piece on Jack Valenti and the MPAA. But on the flip side, as a result of watching it, you sort of understand what the stated goal of the MPAA. You know, the MPAA, MPAA Motion Picture Artists Association, is a a, a a lousy bureaucracy that was created because having a lousy bureaucracy would be better, better than yeah. having the government come in and tell us what you know who can and can't see movies. And that and that's where kind of that particular documentary loses me and when when some of the interview subjects start waxing poetic about how much better it would be if we had a government board uh, to rate movies, which I, as as much as I agree with many of their cases with uh, why the NPAA is a flawed institution, uh, I do not agree that having the government rate things would be a better way to go about it. Uh, it it's a fascinating uh, structure, though, the MPAA. And Jack Valenti is a fascinating character that uh, you should, if, if you watch that movie and you find it interesting, you owe it to yourself to read a little bit more about the MPAA. And it, it's, and part of the birth of that was because the people who would get the blamed, you know, when you had what was, you know, people may have thought was objectionable content were the, were the theater owners. And yeah. the theater owners, they, they showed a film and then somebody went to the lobby and said, ah, you know, they said this and this is inappropriate for my kid and all this. And so theater owners were very, very sensitive about the content and wanting to be able to say, we want to be able to pass the buck off and say, you know, they said this, this, whatever, take it up there. And, yeah. and that's yeah. so much of like, there, you know, that documentary goes in about the studios and they kind of admit the fact that the theater owners have a big control and say on that. And they're the ones selling the content and who want to, you know, meet the market demand. Yeah, um, absolutely. But it, it, yeah, it, I agree with your assessment entirely, Brian. It's a very fast. You got to realize it is. It, is it, it, it tries to say, and, and therefore, when you look at those other systems, though, that you have, like there's a big thing James Franco is criticizing the Australian system, which is a government one that's pretty much effectively banned a film. And we say effectively banned here, we just mean, well, you can still distribute it, show it wherever you want, but people who want to use the MPA won't show it. But in other countries, banned means. Yeah, banned, you literally, you know? they, they will come and arrest you. Yeah. Uh, As we right, did a now, while ago. <laughs> Uh, real quick, Gremlins 2. I have a huge soft spot in my heart for Gremlins 2. Downstairs. Uh, what was that? I got the disc downstairs. Came in the middle <laughs> of the day. All I will say is that to this day, certain friends, if you walk into the bathroom behind them, will give you a hearty, hey, mister, 
Welcome to the men's room. <laughs> Man, I guess uh, I, I guess I forgot that. I, I know I saw Gremlins too, but I don't remember that at all. Gremlins two is a ridiculous. I mean, like if if, if Gremlins one is kind of a masterpiece. Oh, Yo, you know what? Shifts, I might have uh, seen Gremlins two in that HBO way, where it's like you never like how many movies do you remember seeing a yeah, billion times, ours. but then realizing I've never seen the beginning of this film because you always caught it midway on HBO. And and it's it is a kind of disjointed sort of just series of set pieces, uh, you know, wrapped around this kind of uh uh <laughs> like odd critique of uh sequels you know media yeah sequels and media conglomeration and turner broadcasting specifically and warner brothers and everything. And, yeah. what was that yeah and like the the main villain is basically just a thinly veiled donald trump <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah it's donald trump but it's in like a cnn yeah. uh you know center kind of thing so uh yeah no but i love i love gremlins too uh, my pick, I got I got uh, two picks and an anti pick, and I'll run through them very very quickly. Number so one that means one pick, right? We combine. <laughs> yes. No. Yes. It means eventually we will have net one pick. Uh, <laughs> right. Well, I'm waiting. I'm waiting for my my third sub pick of subsection A in Article C of my pick list. Quentin Tarantino uh, wrote a script called Django and Chain. Eventually, got made into a movie, but the original first draft I haven't of, heard of it. Django. Uh, <laughs> is now being made into uh, comics by, I believe, Vertigo. Um, the art isn't fantastic. However, the script is still a Quentin Tarantino script. It's awesome. It's amazing. The first two issues are out, uh, and then I'm going to get the rest of them as they come out on Comixology. But it's just a really awesome, interesting is, way to is, read. Is it G or more PG rated? No, you know this one. It's it's a little more a little more uh, adult, and uh, let's just say that if you enjoyed the I, the concept of Quentin Tarantino's dialogue coming out of the mouth of reprehensible characters like uh, Don Johnson's big daddy slave owner, uh, there are there's a whole extended conversation he has with Christoph Waltz's uh, character uh, King Schultz that is like just horrifyingly awful in the most amazing Quentin Tarantino kind of way. Um, all right. Also, it's something that Andrew and Brian, I believe, have recommended. I started listening to the Star Wars dramatization. Uh, I finally got the, into... The radio drama. The radio drama. So great. And just, if, if that and the Django uh, script just kind of gives you hope that, like, you know, you can expand upon great ideas, you know, that good, well-built universes can exist, that there can exist a more fuller story than, uh, you know, what, what we fall in love with, with like Star Wars and New Hope. Uh, there's so many other awesome little uh, elements, including backstory on uh, Princess Leia and, and Bail Organa, and uh, it's just awesome. And, well, and it's giant really, really scenes that were not in the movie at all, or, or some that were shot in a different form and got cut, uh, you know, what I love about that radio drama is that is whereas the opening of Star Wars, the first episode, uh, episode four, whatever, uh, is, you know, starts with that big looming shot in the action scene or whatever. Uh, yeah. Instead, the choice to start the radio drama with a very small, very private scene of Luke Skywalker privately fantasizing about joining the Academy and learning how to fly. Like it, the, the, the story begins with him listening for the umpteenth time. You can hear him talking along with the recruitment tape as he's excited about joining the Academy and join the ranks of the proud. And he's like, I love it. And, and it's like a, you see, you get a sense of the small town that he comes from and you feel that small townness to Luke Skywalker that is, is, you know, overtly stated in star Wars, but uh, but I don't think nearly as deeply expressed as you get in the radio drama. And you get to meet the jerk friends uh, that he would have met at the Tashi station to pick up the power converters. Yes. converters. <laughs> uh, oh, so, yeah. wormy. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's awesome. It's really, really good. Uh, my anti-pick, I really did not like safety not guaranteed. And What is that? Uh, it's it's a it's a small movie. It's got Aubrey Plaza in it. Uh, the main dude from the league, 
uh, as well is is kind of the uh, the the co protagonist in the story. It's about a couple newspaper or sorry magazine writers that decide to write a feature piece on a guy who's putting a want ad in the paper saying that he wants a companion to time travel with. Uh, bring your own weapons, safety not guaranteed. And so they're going to go find who this guy is and what he wants. Uh, I was eh, on the movie, and then the end is just a complete cop-out, and I didn't like it. So I don't, I'm not saying don't watch it. I'm saying that if you liked it, I'll fight you. <laughs> Amazing. I have there this uh, animosity towards the K-Pax Martian child sort of genre of... Uh, I never saw K-Pax. Was K-Pax just annoying? I couldn't make it through the trailer. I don't know. Well, really? (laughs) (laughs) So, so like, did did you not like Starman? Here's the thing that I liked about Starman, okay? I have put a baby in you. He he starts off as Starman. It's not about a movie of, like, is he? Is he really from out there? Is he? Because those are never going to be satisfying. Well, yeah, but but, I mean, that's her subjective experience. It's like she spends the whole movie thinking, or the bulk of the movie thinking that he's just a crazy man who says he's from outer space. But then she, it's not until she, like, sees. Yeah, but it's the audience. There's no ambiguity. Right, correct, correct, correct. And and that's my point. It's like movies were like, we're not going to tell the audience if this is real or not. Because there's a more important story about are people mentally ill? No, is yeah, are aliens not among as interesting. Us, yeah, is the most important part of the story. So I, I guess also in that category would be a phenomenon with uh, with uh, uh, John Travolta, where uh, remember he sees a flash of lights, and he starts having yeah. super awesome mind abilities. But at least you had the satisfaction of knowing something supernatural was going on. No, but there wasn't. That was a spoiler alert. Like they find out at the He's end, that he has a, a brain stroke tumor. or something. Yeah, he right? has a brain tumor. That's yeah. why he got like super smart because he had a lucky brain tumor. I guess I don't know. Yeah, one of those magical lucky brain tumors, <laughs> <laughs> as they are wont to do. Yeah. So yeah, I, those movies I kind of just sort of I kind of tune out on because I'm like, now nah, there's a more interesting story here. You're ignoring. You just it's oh, we'll tell a quirky story. You know, is he from outer space? Is that really important? <laughs> yes, it's pretty uh, effing important. Yeah, it's kind of kind of most important thing in the history of man. You know. <laughs> Well, ladies and gentlemen, we've uh, we've thrown out there some very provocative opinions, and we've nearly come to blows about the uh, the dynamics of interplanetary space travel and uh, what what price is too high of a price to pay. Uh, all I know, Brian, is if you go on this mission and you come back, I will salute you and I will shake your hand after you've had a very very long silkwood shower knowing you you'd never shake my hand again it would always be the i go in for the bro hug and you do the uh, hey man let's do the uh, let's do the salute let's do the across the room wink and nod well i'll tell you what if you went on that trip with bonnie at the end of everything if you were to rank the greatest adventures in history you would both be number 2 <laughs> It's been weird. <laughs> uh, what's the title? Oh, <laughs> no. Uh, magical, the brown menace. Magical lucky brain tumor. <laughs> or the, the brown menace. No. Brown menace. <laughs> Boom. Oh, man. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, I'll tell you what. Hopefully we'll get that up there tonight, Brian, to start uploading it. And, uh, yeah. And then Dr. Bird will show up. Hey, Dr. So Bird. So this uh, SimCity strategy of inviting a lot of high-profile people with very large Twitter followings to try this. Yeah, not working out so hot. Yeah. Yeah. Um. All right, guys. Well, I'm going to uh, go and get uh, my birthday dinner with Ashley. Hey, happy birthday, Justin. And uh, Thank I'm, you, I'm sorry that I didn't bring you a physical gift, but I'll get you something when you get. What, when are you getting in here to Austin? Friday. All right. Well, I'll see you on Friday. Sorry. Yeah, no. I'll see you. I, uh, Justin, uh, I'm going to show you a photo of your gift. Okay. One of your gifts, if you like. Photo of a gif? gift? Gift. Oh, it's on my iPad. Um, oh, wait. Uh, I... Uh, 
Also, uh, if I could get you to record, because uh, we're, uh, excuse me, night school should be up by uh, tomorrow on yes. Amazon, and hopefully it, it, I have it available for Nook and everything else. If I could get you to record like a little, uh, you know. Oh, yes, for this podcast. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, and uh, actually, yeah, get me um, uh, maybe by tomorrow. Maybe we wait until we have the the links and everything, and and we can actually change that art on the uh, on the uploads. So it'll be like buy night school instead of buying uh, what's it called Hollywood Pharaohs. Yes. So. Which, by the way, let me just point out, and we'll talk about it more in next week's episode, but uh, the lights went out. Um, but night school, awesome. Awesome, 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 awesome. I'm so, I was so over the moon for this book. So buy it when it's out. Not a nonsense. Not a nonsense. Yeah. Come on, bro. Come uh, on, bro. Uh, you going to fund Jeff Kanata's uh, Webernauts the Adventure, but you ain't gonna give just or uh, Andrew May ninety nine cents. Who you think? Ninety nine cents. That's all I need. Ninety nine cents. It's just, just, just ninety nine cents. Dude, you um, see this? Give. Uh, whatever. Here, I'll just... Give ninety nine cents, or as Andrew likes to call it, dirty American money, and not the <laughs> British money for which I really truly love. Do you get more? With the British money? Uh, I mean, slightly more or whatever. I don't I think they adjust it, so I don't make, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, so what? That took all of three hours for Jeff Kanata to drum up $20,000? Dude, yeah, dude. We funded that stuff fast. And all of a sudden, I flash back to every conversation I had with Jeff. He's like, yeah, I, I just don't know. I, I, I just... And I just hate to do it and not get funded. I'm like, dude, you gotta get funded. And then, uh, and now it's like, now I'm just mad he didn't ask for even more. <laughs> well, you can can you do that like extra funding sort of like because I think they you do like st- the Randy stretch biography. goals. Yeah, yeah, stretch goals. He goes, uh, uh, oh wow, look at this. Hold on, let me let me give the update here. It says here, um, er, er, er. It says uh, update number two, stretch goals. <laughs> I really didn't think I'd need to post these soon. I'm starting to think these are attainable. Stretch goal number one, East Coast and Midwest meet up. If we achieve double the starting goal, we'll come on out. PAX Australia. Oh, see, this is great. So he's giving a tangible nature to the episode if uh, if they hit the goals. So that's great. Well, dude, that's so. I'm so happy for him, man. He, uh, he's a good guy. Dragon has... Lasers. Lasers. <laughs> <laughs> nice. That's amazing. That's way to you, Justin. Oh, God. Oh. I'm going to wear the crap out of that. It's awesome. <laughs> uh, have you seen that app, Snaptea? No. Uh, it's iOS, and what it is, it's a design your own T-shirt thing. Throw whatever you want on there. And send it whatever if you have like I you know I I took that image off the web so I didn't list it up there so you know for anybody else but uh um you design your own thing and then it's it's shipping included like anywhere for twenty bucks what that's awesome yeah. wow all right so, guys I I gotta um, run Brian why don't you go already? Yeah. why are you still here burp, 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 burp. gonna Seriously. shut it down I'll see you guys later it was a I've lot of fun go it's been weird. weird. <laughs> Everyone's movement's for you and no one else. It seems so personal, but yeah, it's just for everybody. Two or four guys that uh, I met Paul said, Do you want to join the band? Well, and then George joined. And then Ringo joined. We were just a band who made it very, very big. That's all.